<laughs> so uh, I first introduce very quickly the company. We are Egen. You can see the orange color in the logo. And we are growing. We are becoming at some day big fat as our corporation. So um, that is why I have to use company colors and all kinds of crazy animations. Um, yeah, we love to work in a casual environment. That's where we are all sitting here. Um, and we are gonna, going to revolutionize the fitness industry. Um, first by ping pong and later by our awesome machines. Okay, enough of that. Um, I'm a <laughs> I mean, enough of the, of the orange color. It's not a good background color. It's better for a good logo. Okay, I'm a site liability engineer at EGIM, and my main task is to scale things, and I want to give you a short example of that. And my other main task is to automate things, and I give you a longer example of that. This is what the talk would be about. Um, this is how I feel like. Uh, actually, I, had to, I should use this one with crazy eyes sometimes. <laughs> um, this is from gopherize.me. If you don't know the page, go there and create your own gopher. It's really cool. Um, I have a magic wand and Kubernetes and I can make everything work. Um, we have uh, the major clouds that we work with, uh, Google Cloud Platform, AWS of course, and uh, we try to, to make them work. Um, so that's me trying to make these, these both uh, work together with me. And sometimes um, I have to make them work together with each other. And since we are growing, um, we are encountering problems uh, of a technical um, kind that are related to scaling and then things break. Um, happens every now and then. I call it Wachstumsschmerzen in German. That is the pain of a, that a youngster's body suffers um, from growing bones and tissue very rapidly. So that's, that's my word for what, what we sometimes encounter at the growing company. Um, so it actually happened. <laughs> so that's me again, that are the clouds again, and that is, this, this whole became bigger after a while. Um, so when things break, we usually have to scale it up. What we, what we use for that is that we create our own tools or use existing tools, and this is where Go comes in very handy as a language for tooling. Um, and then we scale things up, and when we did that, um, things are bigger, and there's room for new innovation. There's also room for more SREs. <laughs> Apply. <laughs> okay, now to the, to the real meat. Um, we also automate things um, as SREs. We own the reliability. We do 24-7 monitoring. We have on-call duties. And in the future, we are going to consult the teams uh, regarding scalability and automation. Um, and what I will talk about today, this uh, tooling that we use for DNS deployments. So, a few DNS basics, very basics, only for those who may not be very familiar with DNS. DNS is, um, well, they, 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 they explained it to me like it's a telephone book, but who today remembers telephones? So, I don't know. It resolves names to, to data, mostly IP addresses. And we call this uh, zone information. I'll get into detail that a bit later. Um, there are different kinds of of zone information, so we saw IP addresses and mail servers uh, in the last slide, and this is the um, forwarding, a so-called C name. Um, for the rest of the talk, I just assume that you um, know a bit about DNS, and you don't really have to know much about it to follow the, uh, the things we do. Names in DNS are um, organized by labels, which are separated by a dot. And there's one special label, the so-called null label. Um, this is also separated by a dot, but usually, um, to fancy the human eye, we do not um, use the null label. It's invisible anyway, if you want to represent it in ASCII characters. And also, we uh, usually do not write the dot. But please be aware, for the examples, it will be uh, important that um, a real, fully qualified domain name actually ends with a dot and a null label. Um, then in DNS we have a lot of, um, lot of information about systems or services. This is what we call the host. And the la later part um, 
of uh, usual host name is the, the domain and then the top level domain and I think you all know that. And when, when I talk about a zone, I usually mean uh, one of our, of our domains that end with a top level domain and sometimes we have sub-zones to uh, represent organizational structure. This from Wikipedia. Um, I like that a lot because they uh, explicitly named these um, this year the delegated subzone. We will see that in a minute. Um, this is when a system administrator wants to let other an, an administrators manage some data, then he can delegate a subzone. It's a technical solution for an organizational problem. Um, DNS at Egium is a bit <coughs> um, complicated, <laughs> maybe scary. Um, so far we have 20 plus domains and counting every time we go into a new market, um, a new country, we register the domain and um, set up records for that. So the more, the more we spread over the globe, the more domains are to come. We have 18 delegated uh, subzones. That is where we try to represent the organizational structure in a technical way. We have around 700 resource records uh, without the subzone records, but that's subject to change. So how do we manage all this? We have a registrar where we have registered our domains and we have a hoster, it's like before the cloud was cool, people had hosters, we, we have a hoster for some things and they host a few of our DNS zones. Um, we also have cloud DNS, that is the, the Google solution for DNS. Um, where we ha have a few of our zones and from the register we delegate to these two entities and sometimes we delegate from the hoster to cloud DNS so that's a sub-delegation and then sometimes we delegate again to cloud DNS and then again and again and that's not, that's not that scary um, <laughs> we, we, ha we manage most of the zone information, not all in zone files, like really bind style zone files that are hard to read for humans um, and we deploy them by uh, copy and paste. Um, then um, actually there's some gopher or somebody in the company who has to deploy it and it's always a moment where you're scared it could break and it could render production useless for a couple of minutes or maybe a day. Um, so these zone files are changed by, by different people. We streamline this by using Git so they have version control on the zone files. And then sometimes people directly um, interact with our providers and change things there that are not version controlled. And then sometimes we have scripts to man manipulate DNS records. And then we have other scripts um, that do the same. And then we have sometimes scripts that pass files and make assumptions about that. And yes. Why? <laughs> there must be a better way. So um, what we did was we, we tried to, to rethink the whole process and make it a bit more reliable. And what we want to have is a single source of truth um, where there is version control that is human readable um, and that is non-repetitive. A lot of our records are repetitive. For every zone we have the same answer, for example. So some kind of, of templating engine or something. And then we want to switch all our DNS, the production DNS, to cloud DNS because it scales nicely, it has an API. We can just throw money at it, don't have to run our infrastructure. And then we need something to make that happen. And this is um, what this talk will be about. Um, we want a tool that allows rollbacks when something goes wrong, that allows replays so that we don't have to back up things because we can just redeploy them. If you, if you can redeploy to the same defined state, then we don't need a backup necessarily. We want it to be automated, so there must be a non-interactive mode, and a lot of safeguards, because this is all production critical. So, um, for version control, Git was what we chose. I mean, it's, it's simple, we have it, everyone knows how it works. For human readable, um, we are trying this journal. And to have the non-repetitiveness, um, we decided to use templates. And of course, go for the tool. So I'll deploy my own DNS with Golang and Jamo. And 
What I will talk about is um, the, the two tools I wrote. One is called Papu DNS, um, Parse and Push DNS. It's a very boring name. <laughs> I'm not good at naming things. Um, it passes the JAML format and zone information. Um, it passes templates and applies the templates, makes a big fed, not that big, but an in memory database. And from that, we can export the zones and directly push them to production. And the nice thing about Cloud DNS is that you can push, push the changes atomically. So it either works and your new zone is deployed, or it does not work and all the old records are still the same. That's, that's a nice feature, so they're not like um, zone files that break in transit. It either works or it does not. And then um, I wrote a small tool called DNS check, where I have, uh, again, a JAML formatted file with a lot of um, so-called expectations. This is what I want to see live in the DNS infrastructure and it checks for these expectations and gives me a report whether or not this, this works. This is a monitoring tool that um, some records do not resolve to what they're supposed to resolve and we can get an alert. So these zone files uh, have a format that I yeah, kind of invented which is uh, subject to improvement I guess. Um, we have the zone definitions in, in Java files that start with zone, and then for every zone you have the zone. Um, and see that, that you don't have to use the, the dot at the end. When it's a zone, then I assume, assume that there will be the null label appended to it. Um, you can, uh, can set a zone by TTL, but you can also set the TTL for individual records. Because we found out that for some records we want a very short, and for other ones we want a very long TTL, but mostly we deploy with five minutes TTL, which is the 300 seconds. Um, and then I try to make it a bit more human friendly um, by, for example, um, the C name record, which I actually do not don't really know um, how, how they ever came up with the name C name. Um, so I named it forwarding, and we have a target. And here, for example, the, the null label is very important because otherwise it would, it would be interpreted as um, a sub, a host inside the zone. Um, and then, um, since a computer can figure out whether or not you're using legacy IP or the current state of IP technology, um, we don't have A and quad A records, we just have the IP literals and the right records get generated automatically. I mean, that's not a human task. Um, then we have templates, and templates are basically the same. Um, they have um, a collection of names and they get applied to a zone. That's, that's the whole magic. So there's, there's not, not much complicated here. You can add a description that is not used by the tooling yet, but I thought it may be interesting in the future to have a description if something breaks that you at least know what it was supposed to be. Um, and interestingly, for uh, Jamal, it does not allow one to have an add in a string. That's a, res a reserved symbol. So whenever you use the add, which means the root zone, um, you have to put it in, in quotation marks. I have not found a workaround for that. I think it's kind of the German specification. Um, yeah, then now. Uh, this, for example, is a, a shortened ex um, sh example of the uh, of Gmail. When you want to have your domain email handled by, by Google, then you can just pull in the template Gmail and it adds all the records to the zone. So here again, you see when we when we refer it to a host name, of course we have the null label, and uh, if we don't, then um, it's the regular host. Okay, now the Go part. Um, Go and Jamo. Um, I use the Jamo.v2 package for parsing parsing Jamo, um, and there's a function that's called unmarshal, and you just throw in um, a byte buffer. And what comes out is, um, or it writes to an interface where you, where you have to for, um, define a structure for what you want to, want to see. Um, so you have to define a custom type that represents the information you want to fetch out of the journal. Um, and then there's also another function called un unmarshal strict. Um, and when you use unmarshal strict, then it's uh, stricter parsing. So when there are things that are not expected, then it's also there. Uh, and uh, let's see some code. Uh, 
Okay, here you can see my byte buffer. Um, it has uh, some random information about walkers. And then you can see the structure, how I try to, to match these. And we first, so the, the first part, this one, will be matched by a structure um, which has the exported name walkers. walkers. It's very important that you write the first letter in capital because it has to be exported, otherwise the Java package could not access the variable and could not write on it. Um, and it is just a slice of Jumble walkers and it's defined a few lines earlier, um, which consists of name and type. I tried to do this nested, but that does not work. For some reason you have to define everything, um, either it's impossible or I'm not, not able to do it. Um, so when you have bigger files, like the zone files I showed earlier, it's quite a lot of types you have to define. It's a bit annoying, I think. Um, yeah. <coughs> so that's the, uh, that the information that was fetched out of the Jumbo. And then we can try with unmarshal script. And you see that there's, uh, there's this info thing here, um, and that is not expected, but it is ignored. But when I pass it in the strict style, which I prefer for my files, um, you see, not a Vimpro. Then it throws an unmarshal error. And we use this for our continuous um, integration pipeline that we marshal very strict and rather have the tools throw an error and let the build fail than um, with the actual zone data then that we de um, deploy something that we do not want to deploy for some reason. Okay, now the more interesting part, Go and DNS. And the net package um, is res responsible or can be used for resolving DNS host names. And since Go 1.8, um, they changed something and you can choose if you want to have a pure Go resolver or you want to use a C Go resolver. Well, actually you can only choose if you want to prefer the pure Go resolver, but it still depends a bit on the system and the domain you are, you're trying to look up. Um, if the system uses a Go resolver, the built-in Go resolver, or if it uses a, the one that provided, is provided by the system. In either case, it will use the name servers that are provided by the system. So it's not about choosing the name server, it's more about choosing, do I want to have this whole thing in a Go routine, which is a bit cheaper, or do I want to have an actual thread in the system that may be blocking for a while. And then um, there's also a library for raw DNS queries because the, um, the, the Go, Go built-in resolvers have some interesting effects that can sometimes be a bit disturbing in monitoring. Um, I, I tried to, to find the differences on the wire between the Go resolver and the C Go resolver and at least on my system, on Linux, on x86, it's basically the same. So, I have not seen any interesting difference. But performance-wise, the pure resolver, the pure Go resolver is always always better. So that's, that's basically the resolver. Um, that's, that was added in Go 1.8. In Go 1.7 you don't have the resolver type, so you have to use a later version. And then you can um, um, create a resolver and set the boolean variable to true or to false if you want to use the built-in resolver or not. Um, so you can use this, you can even decide if you want to have different queries to be using system threads or other Go routines. And then you can just uh, use the resolver method, look up host, and give it a context. 
If you don't use the resolver, there is also a net.lookup host. If you use this function, then you don't have to provide a context. But I prefer a context whenever I do something with networking. Um, so I used it here for that. Let's run this. Super simple, looking up two host names. Um, and we will later see why this is a bit why this is a bit surprising. So um, we just have to remember that um, when we look up egen.de, www.egen.de, that we get IP addresses. That's something uh, I want to talk about later. So it's super boring. It's the same stuff again. Now the prefer goes false. The rest of the code is the same. To prove that it really works. Yeah. So the same result. So it does not make a big difference from a programmer's perspective. It's only interesting for scaling. And then we have the raw resolver. And it's a bit more complicated. Uh, at first you have to import it, of course, and then you um, create a client, and then you create a message, and then in the message you can set the question, what you actually want to ask. So I wanted to ask for the quad A record here. Um, you can set whether or not you want the version, usually it's desired. And then you can set the server you want to ask. So there's a lot, lot more flexibility compared to the built-in functions, but you have to pull in a library. And then um, you have to iterate, you can iterate through the records and print out the, uh, the record as a string. That's very helpful for debugging, but of course there are also real usable data types. And when we run this, we will see what I meant with the IP addresses. So the, the www.egen.de does not really have a quad A record, and does not have an A record, but it has a C name pointing to somewhere in the big cloud, and that in turn has quad A records. So when you write a monitoring tool that wants, uh, you want to make sure that what you, what you deployed really is there, then you do not want the resolver to do all this magic in the background, but you, really, you want to see if there's really a C name behind that. And I was not able to manage this with the built-in resolver, so that's why, um, I had to use a library for some for some things I run, and so from a programming perspective, it's very cool if you do networking stuff um, that, that the Go thinks for you and gives you the the results you you properly want. But from a monitoring perspective, um, it's I think it's it's a bit too much too many surprises for me. Yeah, here again, so this is what the record actually looks like. It is a senior. So putting all this all this, this jumble and the Google Cloud API and what we learned about DNS together, we get two tools. One is DNS check. Um, and I will install it, um, def look at the defined expectations with you, and then we do a reality check whether or not the, re um, the reality matches our expectations. Um, and the other tool we get is, is, is Papu DNS. We install that too. We define a couple of zone informations, and then uh, I will deploy this to the demo zone uh, on Cloud DNS. And after that, we can run DNS check again and see if now our expectations are met. Because spoiler, they will not meet at the, at the beginning. Okay. Oops. So for the tools, um, for DNS check, it uses these uh, expectation files, so the, these here, and for Papu DNS to deploy the things, it uses uh, zone data files. I prepared them because they're boring to write. Oops. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, let me deploy. Let me run the DNS check first. So to install it, you just do a go get. Um, 
coming from a URL. And it's eGEM, GMBH, and then it's a bit tedious, it's DNS, tools, CMD. Got that right? Yeah. And then it fetches the source, compiles it, and you can run it at home. So DNS check. And it only takes one argument, these are the expectations. Um, let us look at the expectations first, maybe. It's really hard, it's only one hand. So this is what expectations file looks like. Um, we have every name, including the null label, um, the type of record we want to check, and then the data we expect in random order. So the order is not important, it's actually not non-deterministic in DNS. And the type of records. And I want to deploy these two records today, and so what I do, like test-driven network deployments, I first write the expectations, and then we we'll see whether or not our infrastructure can match them. Okay. It did not. So it had two errors. Um, the domain www.demo.general.com does not exist. So we have to change this. And let's have a look at the zone. It's, I hope you can, yeah, that's big enough. So this is the Google Cloud Platform at CloudDNS, and there's a service um, where we can create managed zones. That's, they call it managed zones. And um, this is the zone name. I mean, you click on it, you can see the records, and you can, you can even add records or modify them via the web interface, but of, of course we want to automate the whole thing. And like everything in the Google Cloud, it has a nice API. Um, to access this, I have created a so-called service account, which is just a kind of JSON encoded credentials that allows automation tools or other services to access the API in a secure manner. So, to prove that there's nothing there, I hit refresh again, and it should, shouldn't list anything. Yeah, it's still only the zone itself. I, I won't show you how to install it, I think you, you get the idea. Um, and Papo DNS has a kind of uh, a few safeguards built in. So there's this, this so-called deployment delay, which is a number of seconds that's added between every zone we deploy, um, because if you automate too tightly, then you can also automatically destroy production. So usually you're not in a hurry when you automate things. So we we will, uh, by default, it adds a 30 second deploy, but of course, you can set it down to zero and have a rapid, rapid uh, deployment. Um, you can do a dry run to see if your zone files are matching it, um, are rightly formatted. You have, can provide a Google project ID string to override the one that comes with a service account file. So, usually, you don't need that option, but if you want to make sure that you do not really deploy to your production project, but maybe to a testing or staging project, then you can set this on the command line to make extra sure it really does not go to production. Then the service account file, and also the safeguard um, that I find kind of useful is max deletions. Um, so what, what this tool does, it does a diff against the actual deployed zone data, and if there are too many deletions, then it refuses. So you have to, to set the number to a level where you say this is acceptable for automation to delete maybe 10 records per run or so. So it's again a safeguard to make sure that we don't destroy production. Um, and then the zone data where all the journal files of all the zones and templates are stored is provided. And that's, that's basically all it needs. So let's first make sure that we don't have to wait too long. So maybe three seconds. Um, Then we may have a service account file already created. And it's in there. And um, deletions, well, we only add records, so we don't, don't have to take care of that now. And then we need the zone data.
And at the end, the last argument um, is a, is a, are the zones that we want to deploy. So you can add uh, as many zones as you want. Um, I only want to deploy this one zone, but I could easily deploy as long as my command line goes. Um, again, we, do, we don't need the, the last dot, because I assume when you deploy a zone, it's actually a zone, and I append the dot for you. OK, let's see if that works. Yay, looks good. Here's the delay, and here's the change. OK, let's, let's go through all of this. Um, the application starts, it reads all the zone information, which is only one jump file in this case, but we have uh, many more files, creating over six, uh, 700 records in the memory. And then it's compiling the zones, which means it looks for templates, and which zones pull in which templates, and applies all the records, and gets a lot of unique, uh, fully quite domain names after that, and resource records. And here it's quite boring, but usually we have higher numbers here. Then it tries to set up the API with Google, if everything works, and then it executes the deployments, which means at first fetching the current state, then calculating a difference. That is another safeguard. In the first versions, it did not calculate a difference, but then we figured out that sometimes it's nice to have a human who um, can later read the logs and see what was the difference and don't have to figure it out all, uh, all by hand. So that's why we display the difference. We have no deletions but two new records, that's called additions in the Google API. And then the, we request the change uh, after a waiting period of three seconds. It goes through, it gets some statistic, everything is good, all done. And that's basically it. Um, let's check <coughs> the proof of concept. We should now see the two new records here. Yeah. Here are the two new records. For the sake of completeness, let me also show you the zone data, but it's really simple in this case. So this is what I use to deploy this. Um, I have the, the, the zone with a very short TTL, that is to uh, don't run into negative caching um, too much, and to run the demo in a short time again and again. And this is the host name with the address literals that created the records. Okay. Um, we can we can check again with DNS check, and maybe if the infrastructure is fast enough. Oops, not there. This one. Yeah, one hundred percent of three match, uh, three. Okay, zero mismatches, zero errors. So that worked. Um, well, this tool does not yet, the DNS check tool is, is not parallelized, but I think that would be nice as a next task for me to parallelize it, because if we, if we check a bigger zone, or a bigger expectation file, I have one at hand, where most of the records should still be okay. So I have an expectation file of our DNS migration, Thingy, for example, it checks about 400 records, and you can see that it takes a while. And mostly, that is waiting for I/O for um, for the network go routines for the resolver. And I think um, I should use more go routines in parallel um, to speed this a bit up. Another bottleneck here is the DNS server that we use because it has to cache all these records, um, and it's usually faster at the second run. Okay, so summary, to finish the talk, um, we started building tools in Go, SREs love Go, because it's from Google and we are fanboys, and, yeah. and also, you, I don't have to convince you why Go is a Go language. Um, we intentionally not use Go routines for critical deployments, um, because we want some things to be slow, humans are slow, so we want our automation to be slow at some point, so that the, that the engineer running the automation or overseeing the automation and can have a beta because the, the automation will always be faster as the, as the humans and sometimes we want to have a human have at least a look um, I want to parallelize some things in DNS check using go routines and channels and um, for the monitoring tool with the expectation files I actually I think it would be cool if it is also generated from the zone information because all the data is already there 
the only thing is that the single source of truth could then become the single source of error, maybe. Um, if something is wrong there, and we check if it's really wrong in production, then it's in making sure it's really wrong in production, and I'm not sure if that really is a, is a good idea. So I'm think, thinking about that. Okay, that was it. Um, have a look at our website if you want to become an SRE or want to like uh, to work here. We are a cool company. We have a dev blog um, where we sometimes publish things. And you can reach me on the Twitters. And uh, feel free to fetch the code. And especially feel free to patch our code. <laughs> Thank you.